Hey, Mike. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for uh, inviting us uh, to your house to be interviewed for the British Trombone Society. You're very welcome. I gather you literally just got off a plane. I did literally just get off a plane, yes, but it's wonderful to have you here, and it's nice to be home. <laughs> ah, well, it's wonderful to be here. Great. Um, right in the centre of London. Um, I was just uh, listening to your album last night. I've listened to it quite a few times, which I don't always do, actually, when I do interviews, but I just kind of kept coming back to yours. Um, and I suppose it's because it's such a major work, particularly for your first album. Uh, it struck me that um, listening to it, and then it's about the kind of unifying uh, tradition of all the world's religions or the unifying force. Um, I was thinking that all the religions contain their own eschatological tradition. In other words, they're concerned with the end of the world. And you chose to start this album with the three quali for four trombones by Beethoven, which was performed at his funeral. Uh, and it made me think, uh, what a place to start an album, because we all face our own eschatological, eschatological eventuality in that we're all going to die someday. I thought, man, this guy's serious if he's starting his first album this way. Um, I was wondering why you chose to start on such a huge theme and um, uh, why you chose to, to really do something that's unusual in classical music, which is to start with a concept album rather than a sort of compilation album, which is what we normally do, isn't it? Yeah, wow, what a fabulous question. Well, I started with the Beethoven. Um, on the one hand, for almost practical reasons, in that I wanted to take it on a process, on a journey, through territory that the trombone doesn't normally tread. So I thought the most logical place to start was with the trombone in its home genre, as it mm. were. So the trombone clearly is an orchestral instrument and uh, our bread and butter is the trombone chorale. So to start with the trombone chorale seemed logical to me because that's point A. And from there, you can take it wherever you want to. But you one should always, I guess, start with your home base, and that's the home base. So that mm. was really the first reason that I chose that and why I chose it to be the first track. Um I also just think that the three qualities are the most fabulous little snippets of music. Um, and it's quite a prestigious part of the trombone's history, actually, you know, to, mm. to be leading Beethoven's funeral cortege. It's, it's quite an amazing honour for the instrument to have had. Um, and did he write that originally for trombone rather than voice? So originally it, he wrote it for All Saints Day mm. in Graz. I can't remember the year. Um, but he wrote it for choir i believe and then later arranged it for trombone quartet um but one of them also was arranged for trombone and choir i believe uh oh, that'd be something to hear i've not heard that yeah yeah no they're amazing i'm not even sure if they if they're still around it's just a manuscript somewhere perhaps but yeah right yeah the famous ones clearly are the ones for the funeral hmm. and why did you pick this, I mean, we'll talk about it and, and kind of pick it apart, but um, every single one of the the, the tracks uh, takes something from one of the major world's religions. Um, and you present, I think Aldous Huxley called it the perennial philosophy, the philosophy that's kind of at the mystic center of all religious thought. At least that's what he thought. Mm. It occurred to me reading your program notes that you probably feel... Uh, much the same. I think you called it omnism. Mm, omnism, yeah. Omnism. Oh, yes, of course. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, omnism is a particular philosophical and uh, spiritual belief system, and I don't necessarily subscribe to one system, so I don't. Ne I wouldn't necessarily categorize myself as an omnist. Um, I believe, like many people, whether tacitly or self-consciously, that religion almost acts like um like a filter you know so christianity might be blue and uh, buddhism might be red and uh, judaism might be green but behind that there's there's light light mm. has to pass through in order for those colors to come and the thing that fascinates me is is that light behind those filters right. and every filter has its place and has to be respected and brings something different and unique to the world and they're all phenomenally valuable culturally and and for people's own yeah, for people's own um, sense of sense of survival in the world, even. Um, but what really fascinates me 
is what connects them all behind that, that light behind the filter. And that was really the, the starting place for the album. I wanted to find a way that, that music could represent that white light behind the green, the red and the blue. Mm. Well, it's um, not surprising to hear that because there's not a lot of ego in the album from, from what I could hear. I mean, a lot of people would choose to, to sort of uh, strut their stuff on their first album. And that's a great thing to do. What do William Blake say? The, the, the pride of the peacock is the pride of God, something like that. And I thought, listening to the Zanarchis and really throughout the whole album, um, it really was only when I got to the end that it, it occurred to me how flawless your technique is. But it was always at the service of this concept you were trying to, to sort of uh, to, to illustrate. Um, and did you have some sort of formative experience when you were younger that that sort of pushed you down this particular path or, or showed you this particular path? It's interesting that you bring that up. That's come up in a lot of interviews, actually, about the ego. I have very particular beliefs about ego and music. I believe that ego is absolutely inappropriate in any musicianship and any interference of the ego leads to a lesser musician. Mm-hmm. Um, I really believe that strongly. And so, like any of us, I mean, I have to <laughs> constantly bat away the occasional um, egotistical moment. Um, but I do constantly try to do that because I think that music is so much bigger and so much better than any of us. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I could have done an album of, um, of, the, of the top hits, you know? I can, I can play them. But, don't doubt that. <laughs> but but I didn't I didn't see what that served. I didn't see what purpose. You know, they're they're fabulous albums out there already by others who quite rightly have recorded them, and um, I wasn't going to play them better than that. And I didn't that that had never in, that had never interested me or influenced the way I play. Um, so I wanted to go for something that that interested me, you know, it was a massive project and I wanted to do something that was going to fascinate myself and I wanted to challenge myself. Like I really believe, I've said this before in an interview, I really believe that um, that Bach piece is pretty much the hardest thing we can play mm. because, you know, the, suite. The, 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 the prelude to the second cello suite, you know, you can, if, if your technique's in order and everything's good, you can learn Bluebells of Scotland in 10 days. Mm took me two weeks of huge amounts of work to just figure out how on earth I was going to deal with the first two phrases of that. Technically, it's not that difficult, but musically, you're coming up against one of the greatest minds that's ever invented, and it's not for our instrument, Mm. which is another really big thing, that if you're going to play it, you have to find a way in that doesn't belittle the composition, doesn't belittle the instrument, and isn't just the shadow of a cello. Right. So that's very complicated to find a way to do. And I mean, so there are technical requirements there, particularly to do a breath control, but there are also musical requirements. There are also um, intellectual requirements. And that sort of process was frighteningly difficult. It, it, I've never done anything like it before. Um, and so technically, yeah, the album... The album is, is it's hard. It was hard to play, but it's, it's hard by the back door, as it were. The te- mm. You're right, the technique is never forefront. Um, and it's not a technical album. But, my goodness, I was pushed beyond my limits to try and, to try and just get it to where I wanted it to be. Mm. Well, it's extraordinary to hear. Um, I'd like to talk about the, the bark a little bit later, actually, in more detail. Um, but in your liner notes, which are very... Um, which shed a lot of light, uh, to coin a phrase, on the uh, the album and your approach to it. You talk about the sacred nature of the trombone. Uh, you even mentioned that the word uh, poisson was the word used in Martin Luther's translation of the Bible instead of trumpet to depict the apocalyptic aspects of the book of Revelation. Uh, could you discuss this uh, sacred history of the trombone? And before you do, could you move your microphone slightly away from you? Just push it slightly that, that- way. Yeah, perfect. Right, Thank cool. you. Yeah, sure. So the trombone has a fascinating history. Um, in the English-speaking countries, we we use the St. James Bible, certainly in Britain. I don't know what they do in America. But um, that 
translates the instrument that the Archangel Gabriel plays as trumpet, but in the Martin Luther German version, it was trombone. And that's a really fascinating academic piece of history because the thread of German Western art music goes one direction and the thread of British goes the other with the trumpet. Um, and both have very specific symbolism. And somewhere back in the history, they were roughly the same, I guess. But because German music, German art music, became the dominant force in classical music, the trombone became the instrument most readily associated with any sort of other world, the underworld, the overworld, um, in, in Strauss, sort of these bizarre new concepts of other worlds that were neither neither Christian nor any other religion. But the trombone represents all of them. And it's interesting because I wonder whether one of the reasons why the trombone has such little repertoire is actually because in the 19th century, it might have been even sacrilegious to have done, if Beethoven had done the trombone concerto, while he was using it in such a rarefied manner in the Missa Solemnis, or mm. Schubert in his Masses, or uh, Mozart in the Requiem, how can you take something that's, that's so symbolically loaded and put it in secular music? Right. So I think it, that has coloured the entirety of the instrument's history because it was on it really was on such a pedestal when you think of even the chorale in the first symphony of Brahms or um certain moments in the Bruckner pieces or the Bruckner Te Deums or all of it you know right up to Mahler 2 the, the transition from darkness into light and the final movement starts with the trombone chorale it's all there and i remember reading something i found fascinating it's not it's not even religious but it just sheds light on the nature of the way the trombone was composed for. Um, Brahms, in a letter to Clara Schumann, really bemoaning the fact that in the Second Symphony he felt he had to bring the trombones in so close to the beginning because he really wanted to save it for the end of the piece to bring this, this, this light switch to the higher realms there. And, of course, fantastically for us, he uses it all the way through the piece, which is great because we don't get bored. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that just shows how symbolically significant the instrument was in that era. Um, and that that takes us all the way through classical music, really. And where does that come from? Do you know? Is that sort of shrouded in the in the fogs of history? I mean, when does... Uh... I mean, I guess it's a form of respect. I guess it's a form of respect for... for its symbolism. As, you know, if it symbolises archangels, you don't want to use them to depict a scene of a pub brawl. Mm. And do you know when trombone began to be viewed in that way as Gabriel's, well, I was going to say Gabriel's trumpet, but as Gabriel's trombone. Gabriel's trombone. Um, I guess it would have been with the with the translation in the 16th century of, right. um, of the Martin Luther. Oh, I see. When they, when they brought it into the vernacular of each country and people started moving away from the Latin and the Greek, that must have been the moment that... So it's hand in hand with the Reformation then. That's so interesting. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Right. Totally. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. And short of the the harp and the and the voice, the trombone must be the most spiritually endowed instrument. Mm. I've heard it often said that it's the closest the tenor trombone to the human voice. Right, I think every instrument would make that claim about itself. <laughs> but the trombone, the trombone does, and of course the reason for that is that the voice is the origin of all music. So mm. of course every instrument is going to be based on the voice. It just makes sense, um, but. The trombone has a particularly strong claim to that in that it uses the breath in a similar way. And also the other thing I think that's significant is the fact that so many of the limitations of the instrument are exactly the same. Stamina, um, slightly stiff jointed, mm. isn't virtuosic in a way that a violin is. That makes it far closer to the voice, I would argue, than something like the piano. Right. Similar Even a shopper might disagree. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting, though, I've even heard Jack White say that some of the most powerful uh, artistic creative devices are having those limitations and having some uh, uh, parameters you have to operate within. It's interesting that when you yeah, speak about... Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you think about it, it's the same in all art form. <coughs> think of poetry. Free poetry isn't particularly effective mm -hmm. because you need something to work against. So if you want to make a really expressive poem, stick it in a sonnet. Right. 
because freedom doesn't give us the freedom that we think it does artistically. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. I was uh, listening to a, there's a wonderful Bob Dylan documentary. He says that the last time that uh, any, you know, we know song lyrics now. We don't tend to know poems, but in the 19th century, everybody would know that they're Tennyson, they're Lord yeah. Byron. Yeah. Um, and you discuss Lord Byron in, in the, um, oh, which which is the piece? The, um, the of the Isaac Nathan. Mm. Um, but uh, the last time, apparently, that, People knew any poem that everybody knew. Poem was Allen Ginsberg, and that's from the tradition of Whitman, which is sort of the where free poetry comes from, measuring from the breath. Yeah, and it's that first line of of Hal, um, and um, then he he implies that essentially because of that lack of freedom, probably the song lyrics, which still have that form, they still have an A B A B, they still have couplets. Um, and even hip hop, you could argue, is an extension of this. Mm. Um, ended up kind of taking over as the, uh, the the thing that people would remember, the lyrics that people would remember went to song. Yeah. And probably because there's those limitations still, there's a verse, there's a chorus, there's yeah. a ballad. Yeah. And it gives you a place to look, doesn't it? It's a map. If there's right. if there's structure there, you can find the points of expression, mm. which are more probably difficult to find. I'm sure there are many fabulous free poets that would vehemently disagree but in principle yeah structure is our friend <laughs> right well i think even ginsburg you know he wrote within a form for a very long time yeah before he you know discarded it in yeah his trademark way um and there we are that's proof of our central <laughs> central london location um so we we talked about you have the you start in the christian tradition with bath and with beethoven um, Beethoven, I know, was born to a, a Roman Catholic family, although it, it doesn't seem that clear what his particular faith was. Um, but I think in those days, if you were born into a faith, that was very much your faith, whereas Bach did come from the Protestant tradition, mm, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm aware, of, of course, that the Chalice Suites are dance suites, so they're secular. Um, but did you, did you change your approach um, between those two pieces based on, uh, informed by the two traditions at all? the differences between the traditions? No. No. Because as with the rest of the album, I was interested in the spiritual link between all of them. Mm. And Bach might have been looking through that particular prism of Calvinism, and Beethoven may or may not have been looking through Roman Catholicism, depending on what you believe he, um, he subscribed to. But as we said before, the light behind them is, in my opinion, the same. So I didn't need to. Mm. The one thing I did do with the Beethoven piece was I was really keen and we worked really hard in the studio with the guys to find a way of getting that fear that runs in Catholicism. Catholic fear is a very particular, particular flavour. And I really wanted to find a way to get that sense of just that, that, that crystal ice that sometimes you can find in, in certain pieces of music of that era. Um, and that's really hard to do in a studio because, you know, everyone's having fun and everyone's having a great time. Um, and we really worked hard on that for the very first entry. We spent a long time on it just to try and get it cold enough, completely devoid of, of heat. Mm. Um, and I think we manage it. I'd like, I'd like to think we managed it. I remember we went into the recording studio, into the, into the booth, and, um, and the guy said to us, we hadn't said to him that we wanted to do it, and he said, oh, that's chilly. And I thought, oh, good, that's the take. Mm. <laughs> um, so that was, the, that was the difference, and the bark stayed warm all the way through. Right. It's very funny you say that, because that's why I you know, framed that first question in that way. Is I, I sort of turned it on, I got my headphones on, I thought, okay, I'll give this a really proper listen, and just thought, you started right at the end of the world here, mm, you know, yeah. whether it's your own personal world or at the end of the world. Mm. It was straight in. Yeah, yeah. Extraordinary. Um, I'm glad you noticed that. That's great to hear. Yes, it came straight straight across. Great. I mean, something about having four trombones in that way already does that, but it's yeah. particularly the way you, you all play. And we tried to thin out the sound. We didn't use any vibrato for that moment. We tried to use quite heavy articulation. All of these little technical devices help for a musical end. Just mm, to keep it, keep it threadbare, you know, keep it, 
very much on the ice. Right. Not any fire in the belly, just ice. Mm. Mm. Yeah, stone that was. Cavernous stone. Um, and can you talk to me a bit about how you, the difference in how you approach the Bach? So the Bach, yeah. I never listened to a cellist play it. Really? I never listened to anyone play it. Um, I trusted my own instincts with it. And I also made the decision from the start that I was going to take liberty mm. with it, that I wasn't going to try and pretend that I wasn't breathing. One of the first things that I thought of was there's this great quote from um, Caballé, the great Spanish soprano, and um, there's a conductor that was, was moving too fast for her and she couldn't grab a breath. And she says, um, Maestro, if I do not breathe, I cannot sing. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, it's a trombone. So the first thing I did was separate different fragments. So if you're noticing, I take, I take actually a long time between certain phrases, which isn't marked in the score. And the reason I did that was because I didn't want to have to try and justify a breath. You know, if we're, it's so easy in Bach to be apologetic for the fact that we're breathing. Mm. Um, and actually, I do think that a lot of the cello suites simply don't work for the instrument. Like the prelude for the first suite, I just don't think works. Right. Um, but this one, I think, does work because space is its friend, you know, to take the time, to take the, the moments of clearance helps the piece. It doesn't hinder it. And I wouldn't have done that if I didn't, if I wouldn't have played it, if I didn't really believe that that was true. So that was my starting point with it. And from there, every note has to mean something very specific. You know, it doesn't matter if you're going forward or if you're going back. The matter is that you have a direction. Um, and so it changed. And from the way I play it now, because I recorded the album probably nine months ago now, I, it's, I play it in a completely different way now. Um, but I just wanted to be sure that at every single note I was going somewhere or proceeding from somewhere or doing something. That was really important to me. And that took months of just playing it over and over again, of performing it, performing it, performing it, recording it. I really recorded myself an awful lot mm. um, to find the way in. And actually I've changed, one of the big things I've changed since is I've since discovered that if I just lengthen the last note of each phrase, it legitimizes the breath even more and you stop noticing it. I, I, I now wish I could re-record it for that reason, that mm. I found a way of making the hiding in broad daylight, as it were, breathing so publicly that actually no one realizes you're breathing. Right. Um, but I also tried, because Bach is so full of warmth and humanity, that I just tried to fill it to the brim with sunlight. That was what I tried to get with it, just to keep keep that warmth mm. there. Um, because I think that's Bach's faith, in a way. I mean, if you think of so much of his music, there's such humanity in it. There, there's no composer that, maybe with the exception of Beethoven, that composed with more humanity. Um and so that was that was what I really tried to find. Right. So, I mean, you have clearly very deeply thought about those differences because what you've just described really is the, the Protestant yin to the Catholic yang, if you like. Mm. Yeah, I suppose I have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm nervous of describing Catholicism as a fear-based religion because I think that will put a lot of people out. And, of course, it's not true. Mm. Or but not entirely true. No. But yeah. Right. But... <clears throat> You think of the thread of Ver Verdi Requiem or the Salva Maze of all of that material. Mm. And yeah, that's a, that really is a long way from something like the Bach. And of course, the Bach, as you said, is a cello suite. But I would argue, as I say in the program notes, that somebody that is that overtly religious does not write secular music. Right. You know? I don't believe that Bach was the sort of person that hung his religion up along with his coat after church on a Sunday. He would have lived with it. Mm. And so I think it's safe to imbue meaning. <laughs> that siren's so loud. It's safe to <laughs> imbue meaning in the piece, even though its label is secular. Right. Yeah, so that makes total sense.
So, The Brook. The Brook. It's the second uh, cello trans- transcription on the album. Yes. Um, why did you make that particular choice? Because I love it. <laughs> I love that piece so much. It does sound pretty good. It's a fabulous <laughs> piece of music. Um, I chose it because those are two... So, Brooke was a Protestant, but Colin Dre clearly is, a, is Hebrew, it's Jewish. And um, he takes two <coughs> Jewish melodies in the piece. And they're highly, highly symbolic melodies, both of them. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, from One is from um, Yom Kippur, the service on Yom Kippur. And the other um, is actually from Byron, who himself wasn't Jewish. Um, but it's, about, it's a Jewish text. And, um, and I wanted, of course, to find Jewish music. And it seemed such an obvious addition. Mm. Um, because it w- I've always known that it worked well on the instrument. There's, I mean, there are arrangements out there. Um, and I've always loved it. I mean, I grew up with Jacqueline Dupre playing. I loved that as a kid. Um, and it just seemed the most perfect bridge between the Bach and the Beethoven into the Jewish faith through that music. Um, I think it might be my favourite on the album, actually. I just love that so much. And it was the last one I recorded. Um, and that was really hard because my lips were really tired. But <laughs> just the beauty of that recording? music. It was three. Three, right. Um, uh, what, uh, sequential, right after each other. We did the order in a bit of a stupid order. <laughs> 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 I won't do it like that next time if I ever But you get did three time. days in a row. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was heavy. Yeah. Heavy. And the morning of the second <laughs> day imagine. was Karen, which is um like smacking a massive piece of concrete in your face. <laughs> mm. And then going on and being like, Great, let's record Alvo Pet. It's uh, <laughs> it was tricky. Um but it was one of those beautiful moments where the joy of that music sounds cheesy. It gave me strength in my face. I remember we had lunch and I was I said to the to the sound engineer I don't know if I've got this in me. My lips are so tired. And he said, why are you thinking of that? That's pointless. Just play. And I was like, yeah, good point. And then, um, and then we went in and the piano started playing. And I was so uplifted by that music. It's so gorgeous. And I just forgot about my lip from that moment. And then I got through and then by the end of the day, it was, it was like a puffin. Not that, but, but for that moment, it was just, it was, yeah. Music hold, holds incredible power. Mm. And that was it just the music helped me and it just it just pulled me through. That's the love of music. It's very powerful. It is. And it, I mean, it's ex- it's extraordinary thing because it does literally give you energy. I suppose that's the, the mystery. Um, I mean, you feel it in classical music, uh, but particularly in and we'll talk about this later in the more riff based mm. music. Um, you know, there's a reason when you march, you sing, mm. you know, there's a reason when you uh, were working the, the fields, if you think of the origin of blues that they would sing. Yeah, right. And I've definitely found myself, you know, getting out of a, you know, it's 2 a.m., you know, you're just getting on the bus and you know you're getting up in a few hours and, you know, the riff kind of starts happening. You've yeah. had about four hours sleep, Absolutely. you're not feeling good and all of a sudden this energy comes from nowhere. Yeah, and this is maybe a strange belief, I don't know, but I really genuinely believe that music holds healing powers that we don't yet fully understand. Mm. I remember reading an interview recently with an incredibly world-famous conductor who proclaimed that everyone's got it wrong and music has no healing power. And I thought, well, why the hell do you do it? Probably because what? you sell, sell uh, why? What's the point? magazines, right? Yeah, I mean, it was, it, was, it was obviously trying to be controversial, but... Who's this? I'm not saying. Name and shame, okay. Yeah, I'm not saying. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought that that is just the biggest load of nonsense mm. how many of us has music healed at various points um that's an aside <laughs> mm. yeah but i suppose also absolutely fundam- fundamental well it's interesting thinking about the the power of music within the jewish tradition because there is something inherently mournful in jewish music um and you discuss that one of the melodies from this comes from isaac nathan's arrangement of lord byron's uh, hebrew melodies um, how did you incorporate that longing and sorrow into the performance? It's interesting because you're, I mean, how old are you? You're 20, 26. 26. So, I mean, we're both young men. Um, but it struck me listening to that that you must have, at some 
some stage in your life come to terms with the reality of suffering, which is also the <laughs> fundamental part of the Buddhist faith. But you, you understood the sorrow. It's there. I mean, it's very beautiful, but that's stuff to get in, in Jewish music. How did you approach that? Um, actually, do you know what? It, this, it, it sounds crazy, but that's the reason why I left it last in the recording. I took a big gamble, but the reason why I left it last was because I thought if my lip sounds a little bit teared up, that's going to all work in the service of that piece. Oh, and I love course. that about that in, in that is, I mean, I'm, I, I hate listening to myself, so I don't, I don't like listening to the recording. But one thing I do like about that track is there are a couple of notes that are on a high A's, quite close to the start. And my sound, I push it right to the edge and slightly over the edge and it almost cracks. And, um, and I wondered whether I should take a different version, you know, because obviously mm. you do multiple takes. And then I thought, actually, do you know what? No. No, no, no. If that is a piece of music that's about suffering, of course there's a crack. Of right. course there's that. And and the sound. It, do you know what I'm? Do you know the bit? I mean, it it slightly breaks. And um, I'm not sure. I I, and I do love actually, that other than about the it. I love that the 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 fragility of my face at that point really fitted with it. And I, actually, that I suppose that was actually quite a good. It was a, it was quite a gamble because it's a difficult. It's so sensitive to to put it last, but that meant from a technical point of view that I was in the right zone for that music, um, and I mean, I just I just screamed through the instrument. Mm. That's 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 the only way I can put it. That that some some in some bits of that music, the protagonist is just screaming, and you have to. Yeah. Mm. Not that I'm a crazy manic depressive guy that would loads to scream about, but I mean we can all find that in ourselves. That's just very human, you know? Right. We all have And it, it I, I certainly didn't try to link it to some past trauma that I've lived through or something like that. Um because it's a universal emotion, you know? It's you don't I don't think I needed to make it personal. Mm. Um because also then then the ego gets back in and the whole point of what I was trying to do was was it wasn't about me um and I really believe that that is the highest not that for a second I'm putting myself in this category but the highest level of great art is not personal mm. you know if you watch a great actor you're like yeah I believe her sorrow if you watch a supreme actor you feel your own sorrow right and I think that's what we should all aim for Mm. You know, I used to do it. Was, I used to do it when I was a kid. When I was younger, I used to play music, and I'd be like, "Oh, I was really sad about doing," and try and think of it and play. Um, great, that's moving for me. I don't know if that's moving for anybody else. Maybe, might make them be like, "Yeah, wow, that's kind of cool." But to really touch someone, don't make it about yourself. It's such an uh, an interesting point you make. I was was reading the other day, I think it was in the Elder Suxley, this perennial philosophy, which is approaching the same uh, same sort of philosophical area that you are. He points out that the word uh, person, persona, actually comes from mask. It's the wow. mask you put on. Yeah. How fascinating. Leave that one there. Yeah. <laughs> Just drop it in. Just drop that Food one for in. Food for thought. <laughs> um... It's an Arcus. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just talk to me a bit about it. I've got a few specific questions actually about some of the, I, I noticed some of the production. Um, you can hear all of a sudden the stereo spectrum come into play. And I was curious as to whether you'd had some hand in that, but I'd like to hear more about why you picked the piece in general first. <clears throat> it's really hard. <laughs> I think there's it's so good. It sounds so easy when you play it. It's a really hard piece. <laughs> um, I think <coughs> there's a tendency with modernists to view them as anti-musical, mm. and it, after Year Zero, forty six, a lot of them were. I mean, there's no there's no doubt that a lot of them were trying to, you know, it's that famous Adorno quote: "How can you write poetry after Auschwitz?" Mm. Um, and I wanted to find a way to respect that, respect the fact that Xenakis was not trying to be Brahms. Um, and I think it's dangerous to try and legitimise that lineage that was purposefully broken. But I think it's also dangerous to ever play music like that 
a musically because I don't think that does it any favors either. And that's a really that's a difficult line to tread because we have to play musically because that's what engages an audience. But to play sumptuously and emotionally that doesn't fit either. So I tried to make it all fire and ice. That was what I had going through my head when I was playing to just try and make one bit like just a raging firestorm and the other bit like a deep freeze mm. and nothing in between. Um, and I tried to make the decision as well. I actually screwed up on one phrase, which I shouldn't have done. Um, and tried to decide not to use any vibrato. That was an early decision I made just to keep everything really flat. And then I forgot about it for one line and played with vibrato because we did fairly large takes. We didn't take it out, um, which is a shame. So that's a little, you can notice that. One note, I think it is, in the middle that I just vibrate a little bit and I shouldn't have done. Um, but that's interesting, just to interject. So, because in classical recording now, particularly, um, even the, the so-called live recordings, it's very chopped up. Um, and I've been on so many sessions where they say, well, we'll fix that later. And then if you're ever in the, the studio afterwards as they're going through it, you can see how, one, that changes the way that people play. Mm. If they think, I don't need to get to the end of this take. We can mm. sort it out later. Mm. Um, and it also, uh, I mean, Saliba Dacia wouldn't even countenance recording at all, would he? No. Um, but the recordings that are around are of his performances. But it certainly affects uh, the the progression, you know, to the to the end of the uh, that that kind of moment in time. Mm. Did you I'm not putting this very well? But it cuts it up. Mm. And by doing the longer takes, was that a, a conscious decision that you take the risk? Mm. you know, of one thing going wrong and having to redo the whole thing in order to retain that sense of direction and that sense of um, of uh, the progression, the parabolic arch of the recording? Or is that just the way the pieces worked out? We did both. We recorded long and short. Right, um, oh, okay. So we would always start by just doing long takes, just the whole piece. We didn't do the whole of Xenicus, actually, because you don't have so many in the tank. Mm. So I, I did that in sections. I did that in four sections, page by page, basically. Most people have none of that in the tank. <laughs> well, <laughs> sure. Uh, no, a lot of people play it. Um, uh, so Xenicus was slightly different because, I mean, uh, it's just pragmatism. It's not a live performance, and I, I can't play that five times through and make it recording worthy. Mm. Probably can't even play it three times to, through and make it recording worthy. So, but we tried to keep the, the takes as long as we could. And then, um, and then, yeah, there were a few points where we really did go very, very close into detail. Right. Um, but that was also because that was never my intention. But the sound engineer that I had was the most phenomenal sound engineer i mean really i've never met a guy with ears like it um and he was such a perfectionist um that of course is both a blessing and a curse because you have to be really really strict with yourself when you're playing your heart out for two minutes and you and you hear over the monitor yeah it was all right third note was sharp <laughs> it's hard <laughs> it's hard to keep it going but um good training of course i mean that's our profession that's what we have to do mm. um but so we did on, in certain moments go very very into detail and I loved that I relished it um, but we never tried to lose sight of the larger picture and I think particularly with the Xenicus that's dangerous because it's so bitty anyway that you need to find a way of making it have some sort of architectonic structure um, which it does have but it's not on the surface in the way that say the Sulek Sonata or something is Right. Or, the, or the Takamitsu. Um, so we had to change our approach slightly there. But the piece is just hot and cold. That's how I would describe it. Mm. What did Jimmy Page say? Uh, whisper to the thunder. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But even that's too romantic. Because mm. that all of that, the the concept of thunder and the storms, and, you know, it's just Sturm und Drang. It's straight from romanticism. So this is like, how can I find a way of making this truly modernist right. truly modernist but also not anti the public which right. is sometimes a dangerous with, danger with that music it's funny because it brings you on to something that i i wanted to ask you about generally before we go on to the the next piece and also finding out a bit about the production um 
you can see why after the First World War, particularly, you know, with the Second Viennese School, that they felt that if these if, if these sentiments or the sentimentality of romanticism had led them to the bloodbath of the First World War, mm. then we should be very, very careful with mm. how we, we use this music, mm. you know. You know, I still will, you know, the rural Britannia is still kind of, in a worrying way, will kind of, you know, yeah. there's, there's something to yeah. it, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, so they, I mean, they chucked the baby out with the bathwater. I think we'd probably mostly agree now in the sense that I don't think they thought there was anything to a fifth or an octave, right. for instance. Um, and I know that recently they discovered, a, I think it's a 35,000 year old bone flute in France. Let's, let's go to the caves. It doesn't matter anyway, because they put it together. Uh, they scanned it and they rebuilt it. And what does it do? pentatonic scale mm. it's still there yeah. just like you would hear in the far east yeah um so there's clearly something to the the symmetry of harmony of fifths yeah and octaves and then you talked about form before i mean if if the second viennese school in some way was about rejecting what came before then in modern poetry freeform poetry is about rejecting those old forms and i, I suppose we were both born in you know in late 80s you early 90s so we're just past that generation that lived through the Second World War and, mm. and were past anybody that remembered the first. And now some of those 19th century forces are coming back into play. Mm. What, what do you think the role of uh, romanticism and these old forms is in, in a modern secular society? I mean, you have religious music here. You've got music that has very clear form. You've also got very modern music. Um, and you kind of bring it all together. How do you do you meld all those different things? How do you approach it? Well, I think the first thing I'd say is that people are right to fear music. People are uh, people are right to be aware of its power. You know, like I remember listening to uh, Carian doing the the Ring Cycle a few years ago, and and thinking then, my God, this music is dangerous. This music has mm. such yeah power to it that we have to be wary of that because music is a weapon and like all weapons it's neutral it can be used for good or it can be used for evil it can be used to incite or it can be used to heal and i don't think they were wrong to be aware of where they had been led um not for a minute to suggest that uh, say wagner is somehow linked to Nazism, that whole that whole strand of thought is perverse and just wrong. Mm. But yeah, romanticism is a bomb. It's incredibly powerful, and I think probably they were right. They were absolutely right to go through a period of cooling off to make anti music. Mm. I think that had to happen. And I think we still have to be aware of of the power of this stuff um, because music can incite whatever it wants to because music is music is derived from language, and language is magic as important as you know water or blood or anything so so it's incredibly intrinsic to the human form and I think that these days people are maybe more aware of that because of the past, I'd like to think. Mm. Um, and that doesn't mean f for a second that romantic music is anything other than absolutely a gift and wonderful. And, and Wagner does have power, but I believe it has great, great power for good. And I mean, think of Parsifal. It's just the most extraordinary, light-filled, world-healing music. Um but yeah, I think we do have to be aware of it. Mm. The, aware of the, the the power of what we hold. There's something you take very, very seriously, in other words. Um, Music, because you described it as healing before, and that's a power. Mm. I suppose it could be is it just as equally damaging. I think we have to be respectful. I think we have to be respectful to what we serve. Um, and I think that respect just comes from realising that music is so much bigger than any of us. Mm. 
and I think we can keep it neutral. You know, I don't think I don't think we either have to be like, oh yeah, we're, we're healers through music. I don't think that's necessary, um, and I don't think either that that it really is a force in any sense for anything bad. Mm. But just a we force. just have to be aware. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what an interesting way to to view it. Um, in terms of the, I mean, I've always said Xenarchus, but I'm thinking that now I'm saying it in completely incorrectly, his name. I'm, I'm sure, sure Xenarchus, Xenarchus. To be honest, I don't yeah. know how you say it either. <laughs> <laughs> I just um, play it. <laughs> well, um, I did notice, and this may be something that happened post-production, but it was, you don't often hear this in classical recordings, that I could hear that somebody was very, very aware of the stereo spectrum in that recording. Um and I just wondered if you had any... Yeah, that wasn't that. me. <laughs> okay. That was my genius. That was, um, yeah, that was the sound engineer. Udo Potrax, his name is. And he, he was making me move. Yeah, was yeah. it? Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, he was playing around with it. Because, I mean, for those guys, they're artists too, right? So mm. their artistic stamp is on it as well. Right. And, uh, yeah, that was one of the things he did. Well, you can really hear it. It's kind of awesome, right? Hear he this did that. Yeah, so I, I just... mean, I was so lucky to work. It was such a blessing to work with him. Yeah. Mm. Such an honour. It's funny because I listened through the album, but I went back on that one. So I went listened to the whole whole track and then thought, well, the whole piece I should say, and I went, and I actually went back before I moved on to the next piece. Right. It was so beguiling to hear, you know, the way that you'd played it and the way that it had been produced. I mean, produced doesn't really is a word that doesn't really give justice to what your engineer did. But yeah. It's extraordinary. I've never really heard it. Yeah, a, a solo recording that sounds like that thanks Udo <laughs> <laughs> wherever you are yeah. wherever you are <laughs> um, the Sulek um, yeah and the Kawali so in the Sulek we once again encounter the Christian eschatology and, yeah um, and I think maybe the only bit of trombone rap on the album I'm not sure oh no Takamitsu as well yeah, yeah. and the Beethoven um, so that's a complete lie <laughs> well yeah but it's mostly it's, transcription it's, yeah it yeah, is yeah. Arrangements. and it's the only really canonic piece Right. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, of course. Um, well, I noticed that, so I mean, that ties into what I was going to ask anyway, but you point out in your liner notes that the, the trombones are literally the horn of Gabriel, mm. heralding the end of the world. Um, and it sort of occurred to me that the Western tradition of harmony incorporates the sense of an ending through the use of cadences. Mm. But in the Takamitsu and in some extent the Kuali folk song, which is influenced by more pagan traditions of, of North Africa, I'm aware that it is Isn't a Isn't that fabulous, that piece? Yeah. That song? Absolutely. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> what a genius whoever wrote it. Did you, um, uh, how, how did the, does the music reflect the fundamental philosophies of these dis disparate traditions? Because the way you approached the, the more... Uh, the more cadential style than the Sulek versus the Kuali, which are right next to each other on the album, I could hear that you'd you'd already gone into the historical context of them. Do you th do you think that the the philosophy we think about pagan philosophies very often they don't have a beginning and an end? I mean, it's maybe too generic a term, but even if you think of we go to the Far East and you think of Buddhism, for instance, it's not really a beginning or an end to Buddhism. Mm. Whereas in the Western tradition, um, there tends to be, uh, in, in the Western philosophies, there is an, an eschatology yeah. in Islam, in Judaism. The time's going to run out. Right, exactly. And then we're in this sort of other space. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how you, how you feel that uh, reflects in the music made in those different traditions? Sure. Well, that's particularly to do with Xenicus, isn't it? Sorry, um, Takamitsu, because... That's a Buddhist principle, that timelessness, that sense of just endless oneness with the universe. Um, and Takamitsu is fascinating because he straddles so uniquely West and East. And I really tried to find a way as best I could to represent both within that one piece because this goes slightly off topic, but Let's the form it. of that piece... <laughs> For me, is it's it's derived from opera. It's basically an operatic scene. I tell you, the one it really reminded me of actually was the. Um, and I don't know why this came to my mind, but I did use it as a, as the as the print for me to build an imp interpretation. And that was um, the Tatiana scene from Eugene Onegin, the letter scene. Mm. There was just something about it that reminded me, and particularly the way that, um, the topic of the 
of the accompaniment of, a, of an operatic orchestra is introduced in the bars before the trombone enters. It's very much setting up that mm ba ba mm ba ba and then the trombone starts playing. Um, and that, to me, is a topical reference from Takamitsu that we're in the realm of opera. Mm. Um, and it's incredibly, it's such a lyrical piece. So that's the West. Clearly, that's Western. That's, that's Western opera. Tchaikovsky, um, any of those guys. The Eastern element comes from the fact that there are moments where he holds a note in his hand for the sake of the beauty and the purity of that one moment. It has no narrative purpose. And um, Takamitsu loved cinema, and he was obsessed with cinema that wasn't narrative, that didn't drive forward, um, because he felt that there was such value in, in that sense of timelessness and the ability to just look at a flower for no reason it's got nothing to do with the story but there it is and it's beautiful mm. um and that's completely different to something like the sulek which i actually the, the similarity is that i did try to treat it very much as an opera without words um and i tried that main theme i really tried to treat as like an announcement of the end of the world. Mm. And then so that first theme, I always thought of it as, as impersonal, that it was like almost like a, a siren, like, yep, yeah, bang, here we go, right, end of the world. And then as the second subject comes in and, and as the more lyrical stuff happens, I then always thought of it as um, individuals, as like, you know, the uh, zooming in to one person in, that, in the middle of that scene who probably is panicked or who is... Um, full of nostalgia or full of just impassioned pleas um, because you know it's, it's such an, a bleak depiction that the Bible shows for that from Revelation um, and I I really try to find each of those I have no idea if it comes across but each of those different elements within the themes um, while trying to make it one because you know it's the same tempo marking all the way through Mm. while trying to make it one weave that, that passes through like a story. And then um, when the theme comes back at the end for the coda, to return to the same place but to view it differently. It's that thing about sonata form that, you know, we want to get back to home, but we want to get back to home having travelled the world and, and home is no longer the same. And right. it's the same thing. And it, But yeah, that is very much devolved, devolved from time. Um, that's completely a linear concept which is, you're right, very much more Western mm. than, than this Eastern idea. Um, and the, the folk song, which is just, I love it so much. It's so awesome, that, that piece of music. I, found, it was, I just found it on YouTube. I, was, I, I knew I wanted to put Islamic music in, and I also knew that um, there, are, there are sections of that religion that really do not believe that music is permissible within that religion. I certainly wouldn't want to insult anyone. Um, but then I found that um, there's that sect from Turkey, from the, the old, Sufis. Yeah, the Sufis, the old Ottoman Empire, who are mystics, and they just believed in the power of music to like to, to, to worship on, God. To come on to that mm -hmm. after I change the camera. <laughs> is extraordinary piece of music isn't it awesome um i heard it on youtube because i was just searching i knew i wanted to include some islamic music and i also knew that you have to be very careful because there are sects of that religion that vehemently believe that music is not appropriate non haram yeah, yeah. um and i of course didn't want to insult anyone so i wanted to try and find some but but I had to be you know a little bit selective um and found that there's a branch of Sufis in, in the old Ottoman Empire in Turkey 
um, who are just mystics, and they and they use that music, that folk music, to worship God. It's just worship music, um, worship Allah, I should say, and um, and I just found it on YouTube one day, just just searching and just found this flute and synthesizer. It was all sorts of funny things, um, and almost cried it was so beautiful i just couldn't believe how beautiful the melody was it's just a melody there's nothing more than a melody in it and just melody and a bit of harmony mm. so simple and um i just couldn't believe that it was so touching and um and then so i thought right well, i'll have to transcribe it um and had a little transcription of it and then we recorded it and actually we'd never rehearsed it before <laughs> we because uh, i i left it really late i i did i did the transcription on the plane on my way to the recording really yeah um so almost jazz really it was very jazz yeah really because um i'd had a rehearsal with the with the harp player emily hoyle who's a fabulous harp player and i knew that she'd done a lot of folk harp and i also knew that i wanted to keep it free because i was happy to play around with it and whatever and so we we just um we got together and it was actually only two or three days before that we said okay this really needs percussion so that was when we pulled in another friend um who was really kind and flew out for it and um yeah we just got together in the studio never played and i was really nervous because i didn't know if it was going to work mm. because i hadn't heard it before and i think it works actually really well i'm really happy with it um and and we just had such a ball with it because yeah we were just playing around in the studio just particularly there's a there's a section in the middle which is improvised and the way that they were improvising i don't know exactly what instrument it was but it was a so it is improvised that was going to be my next question yeah um I, I basically tried to copy as closely as possible the transcription. I, I transcribed the solo, but it was impossible because they'd synthesize it and they'd overdub things and, and it was two lines at once. And it was right. also a, a flute that was a folk flute and they, they were doing extraordinary things that I just couldn't do. Um, and, and yeah, so we had to sort of make it up as we went along. But I just think that it's so seeping of mysticism and just and the thing that really fascinated me about that piece was how similar it was to some of the christian stuff you know like it yeah i mean i just felt exactly the same when i was playing it Mm. um which was just this is just worship of (laughs) i'm tempted to argue just it's just the same thing you know whatever you want to call it it was just the same exactly the same principle um, and it felt just the same to play, which I found really interesting because I hadn't expected that. I'd expected it to feel quite different, mm. um, but not at all. You know, all human, I guess. I mentioned um, Ginsberg earlier, and um, I, th- I don't know if he was quoting Suzuki, the the Zen you know Buddhist uh, writer, um, but he used this line of bringing you into the fullness of the moment. Mm. And perhaps that being the defining characteristic of any sacred art or sacred music particularly. Mm. But it struck me that with the Kawali song, that it it's such an interesting mix of the clearly the African, particularly North African traditions of rhythm mm. and the the you know, Islamic tradition. And as I was listening to it, it also occurred to me that uh, this I listened to this great interview with uh, James Brown and Bootsy Collins also talks about this and he talks about in funk the one it's not your one it's not my one yeah it's the one yeah and you better be on it once again back to ego yeah um and um uh listening to you play through this piece it made sense that it was improvised because that technique or that technology of of using drums and knowing that there's nothing else that's set but the one Mm. and just like a heartbeat or just like breath or just like us cycling around uh you know the center of the uh the solar system around the center of the galaxy eventually it becomes something that you just integrate you Mm. don't really notice it anymore yeah and then it's got you yeah because it's 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 behind yeah you know it's all around um, and in that space that it creates, and I'm a tuba player most of so I noticed this, that you play a bass line, and everyone listens. You play the same thing again. People might start to talk, but then they start to move a little bit, and then eventually they almost disregard it, and you're sort of watering this seed. Mm. You can't see what's going on, but you know, under the earth, it's 
going, and then eventually something comes from the moment, mm. just as a product of of playing this riff again and again. Yeah. And Moussi Iriad, in uh, his wonderful anthropological uh, study of the world's uh, shamanic traditions, called it the archaic techniques of ecstasy. The archaic techniques of ecstasy. Beautiful. I thought that's exactly what this is. Yeah. So did you did you do a few takes of it, and did I mean did you find that you had a, a different sort of improvisatory direction each time? Uh. Well, we were improving really as a group, so I didn't, I didn't take it in my own direction myself. Um, we were, we were doing it collectively. So switching octaves, switching dynamics, switching. Uh, I mean, so basically, look, it's just a melody most of it, and I didn't spice up the melody too much apart from that one bit of improv in the middle, mm. which I tried again to stay as close as I could to the original. So it wasn't improv in the sense of jazz. It was improv in the sense that we were making it up as we went along in terms of octave displacement and volume and um, vibrato and and obviously notes as well, but um, those things. And the heart part as well, we had to change a lot. Um, and she was fabulous at it because she was just playing around and just having fun. Um, but absolutely, you're right. Once we found that groove to it and also the, the colour of it, the what it was trying to say, you become a lot freer. You know, you find the the centre, and then once you're locked into that seatbelt of the centre, you can take it anywhere. Right. And it's not going to, it's not going to leave that place. Hmm. Well, that's very interesting. And I guess that's the, in some sense, you explore the harmonic side of the sacred music, the melodic side. And yeah. And you explore that rhythmic side. Yeah. Yeah. In general, and I will let you go soon because it's been a, it's been a, I've had you for an hour, hour and a half. Um, but I was curious. I mean, we we were talking before the cameras came on a little bit about fasting, um, and I can tell just from you know your uh, what we've discussed in this conversation that you must have some approach to your own training, not just as as a trombonist but as a, a human being. Mm. Um, is there anything you do particularly and how does that inform your, your training as a trombonist and as a musician, but also as a trombonist in the physical sense of having to play the thing? The thing that's made the biggest difference for me is probably meditation, which I never actually did for music. Um, I, I am, <laughs> I'm, I'm really hyper quite a lot of the time. Um, I'm, I have a lot of fun, spend a lot of time pissing around and I need something to crown me. And so meditation is obviously fab for that and um i can i can i ask what sort i mean you said the ohm earlier do you chant the ohm or... no not at all i just look at a candle it's right. not even really meditation i guess i look at a candle keep I keep it grounded like that what's that called spend what's... half an hour looking at a candle ten 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 tetrika tri- tetrika tri- 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 i have right? no idea there's a word for it probably i just look at a candle <laughs> i don't know um which i love I, I really love doing it and i just i noticed about six months ago that I was on stage and um, and like we all do, I got a bit of a busy mind on stage and I just, I, a thought came in and I was like, nope, not now. And then I was like, oh wait, that's a meditation technique. Right. I hadn't even realised, I hadn't done it for that at all. But I found that really in- interesting and really helpful for playing. Um, when, particularly as an orchestral musician, when you sit there for three movements and you're thinking about your pizza and about, mm. <laughs> you know, what you're going to do tomorrow and right. the, the funny things that you want to chat to your colleagues Did about afterwards. Right, exactly. <laughs> And then suddenly you've got something hard to play in the fourth movement and you have to get in, spring into action. It's useful to have a way just to, out you go, there's the door. Hmm. See you later, right now work. Um, so yeah, that I find really helpful. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, it's pretty obvious from the album, I'm a, I'm a spiritual person, like a lot of us. And uh, there's no question that that influences every aspect of my playing and every aspect of my life. Um, but I'd be hard-pressed to say exactly what, with the exception of what we talked about earlier with making it about me, making, you know, that, that egoic aspect of it. Um, I do work hard on that hmm. because I think it matters. And I, I, I can hear it. I can now, I've got to a stage where I can hear it in music and I, I don't like listening to musicians with massive egos because mm. you can hear it. 
and it's toxic and it sounds just I, I, and the thing is they're often of course because they're driven fabulous musicians and technicians I mean the, the best in the world very often but I, t I don't care I don't want it I, want, I, want, I just don't want to listen to it I'd much rather listen to someone that is just flicking sand in a sandbox like a kid just having fun not doing it for themselves but just doing it because it's fun right um, and I think that the very very best always come from that place um, do you not agree I just think I don't, I don't to be honest I don't know how, how many people would agree that with that that you can hear someone's ego in their playing but for me it's a right turn off I think it depends doesn't it I mean do you listen to something like well, it's tough to say, is it? So something like uh, I always think of uh, the the tradition of the blues. So you mm. think of, of in England Led Zeppelin, who I love, mm. um, or you think of Hal and Wolf, and they do have these huge this swagger. But in a funny sense, when they really get into it, I think that whatever it, we we call that ego mm. uh, or persona, I mean that that sort of that drops away, mm. and what what is there is far beyond their publicity material or yeah uh, absolutely and i mean there's nothing wrong with having swagger <laughs> come on you need it and you need self-presentation of course you do but and as long as you realize that it doesn't belong to you you're fine that's that's really all it is mm. that i i come from a place where i genuinely believe that what i do for good or bad um isn't mine i don't believe that i i own any of what i do um, which keeps me safe because it means that if I get really bruised by like, you know, losing something or, or having a bad concert and getting a bad review or whatever, or someone saying something mean to me after a concert, sure, it hurts. Uh, of course it hurts, but it hurts far less because it doesn't belong to me, mm. you know? And in the same way, one of the really tricky things about being a musician is when people pump you up when people, right. you know, maybe you get a good fee and maybe you get... Um, big praise, you know. To keep that not going straight to your head is is really hard, mm. and um, and really important, because it because because the moment it goes to your head, the only thing that that remains there is for it is for you to just drop back out of that and just have a bit of <laughs> bit of misery for a while while you while you come back down to earth. So we don't you you don't want that, right? Um, and that 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 can be tricky. But I mean, that's part of the that's part of the challenge, and and it's the thing that keeps you playing well each day. I think to keep it impersonal. Mm. But there must be some balance. I mean, I know what you mean in the sense that you wouldn't want you don't want to be narcissist stuck forever staring into the uh, into the stream at his own reflection. But I do wonder. So I was listening to John Lennon of all people. And he was saying, because he'd had some experience with Timothy Leary in the, in the 1960s and about trying to achieve what he termed ego death, mm. which I think is probably the hallmark experience of any mystical experience. Mm. In fact, there's a wonderful, it's peer-reviewed uh, uh, journal, which they, sorry, published in peer-reviewed journals, but uh, publishes a book called The Mind in the Cave, mm. which talks about the, the, I think it's four or five different indicating factors that, that, uh, that show that you've had a true mystical experience. Mm. Uh, but going back to John Lennon, he was saying that he had these mystical experiences and he tried to completely destroy his ego mm. and that he came back and realized that he had to be okay with being a person in this particular time, in this particular place, I'm paraphrasing, but mm. to be John was okay as well. Yeah. yeah. And I do wonder if, um, if all those things that we think are bad, like ego, Listening to Aldous Huxley, he says uh, it's a reducing valve, the reducing valve of consciousness, and that it's there for a reason. Mm, of because if, it is. if you're in utter ecstasy, oh, no, no, no. and boom, the car hits oh, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you no, need to. <laughs> I'll tell you exactly what I believe. I believe that the ego is necessary for us to be able to have, um, yeah, for us to be us, right? Of course, you have to have an ego. I am me, and the ego is what allows me to be me. Mm. If, if I didn't have an ego, I'd be. A blob in space or, or like I, I you wouldn't exist of course you have to have the ego but that is the end of its function that's what i think mm. and i mean that's what i've been taught of course none of these are my views um that's what i've read and and that that's just what that's just what makes the most sense to me 
And taught by whom? Is there a particular tradition that I mean? You're obviously drawing from a lot of different traditions, but is there yeah. a particular one that you, you know, not subscribe to, but that you found, um, you know, particularly helpful? Um, I was fascinated by. Have you ever heard of a guy called uh, Omram Mikhailovanov? He's a Bulgarian spiritual master and is philosopher. From the Gurdjieff school. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know, but um, he he talks about that a lot. Um, that you know that is that is the end of the function of the ego, to make me me. Right. But and but the but but the bit where like, oh, I'm really good. Mm. Ooh, yeah. No, you don't need. No, I I I I'm not really good. I'm not really bad either. I'm nothing. I'm just I, like, I, I I do what I do, and that's it. It's very difficult to explain, um, but. none of it belongs to me is what i think mm. and that for me i love that because i used to suffer a lot with nerves and that was the answer to my nerves to be like well why do i why would i be nervous because it's not mine if i walk on stage and play crap it's not mine mm. if i walk on stage and play really well it's also not mine you're part of something larger than yourself yeah i mean think about it why why could we possibly take credit for being born with a gift? Like it's it's just luck, mm. in a sense, isn't it? Like, why do I have ginger hair? Luck or providence? That's the I question. I couldn't. Well, sure. Well, that's a different question. But I but I couldn't ever claim that. I couldn't ever put ego into the fact that I'm ginger because I didn't choose it. It was mm. I was just like. One day grew hair, looked in the mirror, and was like, "Huh, I'm ginger." I have to and it's taking pride in my ginger beard. <laughs> it's, just, well, but it's just the same, isn't it? Like, why, if if someone's born with talent, what right do they have to be proud of that? Hmm. Because they didn't cultivate that talent; they were born with it. For, no, that's the wrong word. Of course, they have to cultivate it, but that, but that, like, jewel of a kernel of something that's there, not theirs. Right. It's a gift. Yeah. That's an interesting view. I hope you don't mind me coaxing out your um, more specific views on it. No, not at all. But that does that make... Do you, do you see what I mean? That's, I do, I think, yeah. It's, it's, mean, it's kind of difficult to explain without, without people getting in a muddle about what I mean, but... The language is... I've heard from, uh, you know, my reading that languages like Sanskrit have the... They have the, the words to describe some of the some of the concepts you're talking about but the english in some ways you have to kind of read between the lines a bit more yeah like they have a sat chit ananda which means uh, uh it's like consciousness awareness bliss something like that and they have very particular meanings and pali i believe is the same and some of the ancient chinese is also the same so i don't think it's unusual that in in english we don't necessarily have the the language to describe some of the concepts you were talking about. Uh, yeah, that's here saying no, as I don't absolutely. read Sanskrit. So no, and to be honest, it's it's an, it's quite a new way of thinking for me as well. I just read about it recently, and I thought that makes so much sense. And uh, as I've I did I did a series of concerts in the summer, having just read it, and I had the really bizarre experience of on on stage of reading. Could you? Uh, it was a load of it was a load of um, Mikhail Ivanov books right. that I've been reading. Um, and I had a really bizarre experience on stage where I I felt, and I don't mean this in any sort of weird, illogical sense, I felt the will to just, I wished that I could just disappear because I felt so unimportant. Mm. What was, what was the, the trombone, of course, is important, the music was important, and, and everything else was important, but I just wanted to somehow fade into the background and just like, if the audience couldn't notice me and just notice what was coming through, then my job was done. Right. Um, which is, it's, it's kind of, it's almost illogical because we're taught to self-present, to sort of pluck up our peacock's feathers, but all that does is get in the way of your message. Mm. Um, and, and I think that <laughs> is, uh, I think that's in the album. I think you can hopefully see that idea, which takes it back to what you were saying at the start. That's why I didn't want to put in you know the row parts and this is Mike Buchanan's interpretation of this particular piece because I, I because I mean I'm, maybe at one point I will do that and I'm not saying we shouldn't do that of course you should um, 
but that wasn't what I was that wasn't my headspace right when I when I came up with this album I was trying to get away from all that mm. I think you've certainly succeeded <laughs> <laughs> well thanks very much for finding the time to speak with us at the British Trombone Society oh thanks we went very deep that was a uh... well that's <laughs> the name of the game is there anything else further you'd like to add um, I mean obviously you can hear the album on Spotify but it's always nice to buy a a hard copy of the thing um, I'm sure that a bit more of that goes to you and it's a beautiful object to have um, but is there anything further you'd like to discuss or leave our listeners with happy Christmas happy Christmas better get this done before Christmas <laughs> it's going to seem really silly well okay. yeah Christmas <laughs> is always around the corner no matter what time of year oh that's true yeah so I need to edit it in the next two weeks or in the next 54 yeah, okay exactly. good Perfect. I'll try for two Mike okay. <laughs> thank you very much thank you very much appreciate it ha ha ha